Hello, and welcome to another Elite Performance Team podcast. Dominic Burlow, Dr. Jan Kasperitz, and a very special guest, Jennifer McDonald from Jennifer Lane Acupuncture and Wellness in Rutherford, New Jersey. Jen, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, let's see. My background, so I'm an acupuncturist. I own this business. Um, we kind of were grassroots in one man show for a long time, and then it slowly just evolved. My background's in nutrition, I'm a dietitian. Um, kind of transferred out of that whole world by way of life. Things just change. You start off in one career, and then you know you get a job, and you maybe you're just not happy, and things evolve. So I was a dietitian. Did not want to work in a hospital. That wasn't my thing. So I transferred into the health club world. That was amazing. I learned a lot but the corporate life was horrible and stressful, so you burn out. And um, I knew I wanted to get back into wellness, but in a more healthy way and more one-on-one -on -one healthy people. So I just kind of stumbled into acupuncture by way of going for a treatment, and that just sparked the whole chain, and here I am, so. Do you practice Eastern or Western acupuncture? It's a fusion of both. So I went to two different schools. The school here in New Jersey is all traditional Chinese medicine, which is amazing, and that's what you need to know to pass your boards, your national boards. But after two years of doing that, the program's three years, so after the first two years, I said, all right, let's learn something that I might be using a little bit more, which is this trigger point, more modern style of acupuncture. So I did two years traditional, transferred into the city to a college that is all trigger point modern acupuncture. So I graduated from there and did my clinical work in that style too. So most times it's a fusion of both. It's heavier on the more Western style, but definitely do both. Any questions for her, Doc? What actually got you into acupuncture? Because I actually have pretty good experience with it myself too. So, you know, going back, way back when, for some reason, I don't know, as a teenager, I was reading books on yoga. Like, who does that at 16? But I was. Um, I remember buying, like, the Joseph Pilates book in college and, like, doing these, like, mat exercises on the floor, like, doing the hundred on the floor of my dorm room, learning that stuff. Um, so I just had this kind of foundation of interest in being healthy. Um, my stepmother is a yoga instructor. She did the Kripalu, like, really. Like, she's solid. So I had that as an influence. Um, I knew I didn't want to be in traditional Western medicine. I didn't want to be a nurse, something a little bit different, um, something more unique. So when I was sick, when I was working in the health club, I had this nasty sinus infection, wouldn't go away. And one of the members had said to me, you should probably try acupuncture. So I was down for anything, you know? So I went, and as soon as I left, I'm like, Oh, holy smokes, that was super cool, and that's something that I could get into. So I didn't jump right in right away. I read a couple of the textbooks, thought about it a while, but could I actually do this? Is this a viable career? People will keep other people do this besides me. So that was my, that was the impetus though. So after I, you know, decided to take the leap, here I am. Yeah, about nine years ago, I was uh, much more competitive in cycling. Um, I used to be a lot bigger. I was uh, mm -hmm. actually what we call overweight. <laughs> I went after college, uh, a lot of cookies and beer. That BMI. And then, exactly. <laughs> and then I started doing cycling. And I started going from like 20, 30 mile rides to doing like 50, 60 mile rides. Mm -hmm. And my low back started giving me some significant issues. And I also had a uh, part of the lumbar disc herniation club as well. Mm -hmm. So they st started bothering me a lot. So I was doing like spinal decompression therapy, which works extremely well. But it wouldn't get rid of the spasm in my back. Mm. No, no matter what, I kept having that spasm in my back. Every time I stood up out of seat, I had to kind of get a running start to get up. Right. So we had this acupuncturist in our office, and he was practicing Eastern uh, Eastern acupuncture. And um, he never once put a, a needle in my back. Mm -hmm. He would check my pulse points. He would look at my tongue. He would look at my eyes. He would see how I could breathe. Majority of the time, he would actually uh, put needles into my uh, feet, into my ears, on my face, into my hands, and pretty much that was resolving the spasm quite a bit. You know, was it going to fix the disc herniation? Yeah. No. But what it does, because uh, we were talking before about bio optimization tools, and 
how individually they work well. But when you start stacking things, and like, I'm a chiropractic physician, you're an acupuncturist, you're also a nutritionist. If you do just one of those, you're gonna get better. But if you go and do acupuncture, you do nutrition, and then you also do um, chiropractic, and on top of that, you put mindfulness in there too. Now you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're, now you're doing something. Yeah. One of them at a time, you're gonna get benefit, but all together they work extremely well. Mm -hmm. So with the acupuncture, that's kind of what sparked me into doing, getting away from the, 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 uh, the normal chiropractic thing where you're putting people on these treatment plans and everything, made me look at things much more holistically. I'm like, my lower back hurts, he hasn't even touched my back. Right, right. So there's something else going on. And I'm a huge fan of, of the whole yin and yang and, and, yeah. the, and the energy centers of the body. A huge, huge believer of it. Mm -hmm. And also uh, Dr. Sarnow, which mm -hmm. a lot of chiropractors yeah. do not like. I really? Think they don't because it's taking patients away. It's taking patient visits away because people can read a book and understand there's a lot of emotional um, issues which is creating a lot of their pain. So one of the things that I do with patients who come into my office is if somebody's having neck pain, uh, scapular pain, low back pain, before I even talk, before I even touch them, try to build up some rapport, see their past medical history, see if there's any anxiety, any depression, find a nice comfortable way to bring that up and see if it's everything potentially stress related. Well, it's funny because when you talked about your experience of not getting any needles in your back, the, well, the areas that you're talking about, points being placed, you absolutely was treating your constitution. You knew you were stressed out about sure, it, totally. you know? So that's, that was some of those points, 100%. And, that, and for years, uh, I think I talked about this in the podcast, with my anxiety, for years I thought I had all this great nervous energy just filling me up with, with energy. Right. Until it came crashing down one day with a serious anxiety attack. and. And that's pretty much what it was. Lots of anxiety, didn't know what it was, even though I was exercising quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I wasn't finding a way to build a good, positive relationship with anxiety. Mm -hmm. How about yourself, Don? I, I'm trying to think how many acupuncturists I have seen. Jen is my acupuncturist. Um, I started going to her early this year. Really, when I ramped up my training, my glute muscles were locked That solid. left glute mean. Right. I, <laughs> and um, Jen loves watching me squirm in pain um, as she releases that yeah. muscle. But I, I, not because you two are sitting here, but I, I these two, are, you guys are my favorite practitioners. Mm -hmm. And thanks to them, I went to the start line of this marathon, which didn't turn out so well. I went there uninjured because of both of you guys and your work. Um, I, I went, when I first came to you, it was a very similar approach where you asked me questions not related to my body, but more about my overall health and what I've been through and so on. And you, and you treated me for more than just my glute muscles bothering me. And we dabbled in the, the stress and anxiety at the end of it. And it is so true that some people are just because of stress and anxiety. Absolutely, and it's crazy because you don't really realize how it drives you, right? So if you're an anxious person, you might be running extra hard and maybe the wrong way because you're just running from your anxiety. You know, so like you might at be actually exercising not in the smartest way just because of this anxiety that you have, you know, that you're, that you're working up against. So if you can be more emotionally Stable, not that you're unstable if you're anxious, but maybe just more sound. You kind of just make better choices overall, right? So, it, it all, it, there's no way to, to untie it from each other. It's all connected. So I was running away from my anxiety for a long time, mm -hmm. and um, I, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress after mm -hmm. some stressful incidents at work, and. When I ran, I felt okay. Yeah. So what did I do? I ran. Yeah. And I ran, and, and I remember my my psychologist saying to me, "What are you gonna do if you get hurt?" Mm -hmm. And I I said, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I have plenty of patients like that. I worry about them. Right, and mm -hmm. it's true. And and I didn't have a backup plan. And we that nervous energy. Doctor talking about that nervous energy, and that's that's exactly. I just thought that's what it was. I didn't. I didn't realize I had this underlying anxiety starting mm -hmm. to come again. And I walked into your office, I think the week before the marathon, and it was written on me. And you were like, Oh my goodness. 
Yeah, okay, right? you, you, you actually <laughs> said that you could feel it in that room, and, and that's me. I, I definitely get myself hyped up. Yeah, well, it's important to you too, though, so it's Absolutely. normal to be anxious and worry about it too, and that's the kind of thing with anxiety. Side note, it's normal to be anxious, and it's normal to be worried. That's fine, but when it gets to the next level, yes, that's where right. stuff in. Right, right. Jen, tell us about your nutrition and, and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis as far as eating. So, being clinically trained as a dietitian is an interesting way to think. It's very food guide pyramid, right? It's very basic. Here's your carbs, that's your foundation, you know, and you go up the pyramid and at the top are like your sweets and whatever, fats at the top maybe or something. So, I was taught a very calorie counting, here's your, you know, 2,000 calorie a day diet. And I think I lived that way for a while. And then um, I feel like I was always coming up short, working out. You know, I could always, I'm, I'm genetically, I'm blessed that I'm, that I can be a thin person pretty easily. But I always wanted to be stronger. And I always felt like I could get strong if I took a week off of the gym though. I was just skinny fat, you know, like here, sure. right, like olive oil, olive oil's back, you know. So I did that stuff for years and I think I tortured myself with like, I don't understand, why can I get stronger? So I just work harder, work harder, work harder in the gym and I still wasn't getting the results. So I kind of started to play with different ways of eating. I flipped over, hmm, let me go to paleo, let me do the whole paleo thing. I knew a lot of friends that were doing CrossFit. Helped, definitely, like I definitely, felt stronger in the gym, but physically ugh, did not. I felt bloated. I was always full of those eating like all this meat, you know, which didn't resonate with me. So over the years, I've gone back for tried different things. I love experimenting with food. So it's, it's, it's so fascinating to me. Like if you look at food, like what can this do for me, right? Like I'm holding this avocado in my hand and like I know how my body is going to process this food is so different than is how it's going to process this piece of meat or it's going to process that bread like that's so fascinating to Absolutely. me right so when you go to the grocery store and you're walking around like that's how i'm looking at things like ooh, look at the color of those you know purple cauliflower sure. like, that's probably really badass to eat that's something that's going to help me um so that's really how i wrap my head around how i look at food and, and that's that's the foundation for how I eat, you know? And then also on the flip side, I know that if I'm gonna eat something that's crappy, like, it's not good for me, but, you know, make peace with that and understand that you can go ahead and enjoy something and it's not gonna be of any benefit to me, like, nutritionally. Um, right now, for the last um, five months or so, I've been doing a ketogenic diet. It's my second time doing a cycle of this. I started last, summer because I have these really bad seasonal allergies. Went to an integrative doctor. She had me on the candida diet. And it's just like a touch away from the ketogenic diet and some of the things that are allowed. So like, this is me, it's like all or nothing. So I'm like, well, if this is what she wants me to do, then I'm gonna just go one more level and do this crazy keto thing that everyone's talking about. When you're in dietetic school, being in ketosis is not what they want. Like that's always that you're taught no way. That's, sure. that's when you cross the line and you're, you know, there's not enough glucose, you know, not enough glycogen. So it's like this is all kinds of wrong if you compare it to my training is as a dietitian. But whatever. At that point, I wanted to try it. So I felt like I did a really smart way. Um, not loading myself with tons of unhealthy fats. You know, like my fat is olive oil and avocado all day, every day. You know, maybe some almonds or something, macadamia nuts or something. But um, so I really felt good. I cycled off in the winter. I was came back on the spring, and honestly, I love eating like this. I feel you feel so like intensely weirdly almost creepily like clicked in mentally that it's it's like like okay like i could keep going right now and that feels strange but it's not a false like i've drank too much coffee because that's a whole different feeling um it's just like my core like my i have my constitution can handle so much more my workouts are amazing. You know, I've learned you have to kind of tweak things a little bit to see how, you know, okay, I got it. I'm gonna run long tomorrow, so I should eat this. Like, you kind of figure that out. 
But so I've been doing this with a little bit of intermittent fasting. I mean, I always do a 12 hour intermittent fast at the minimum. It's probably usually 14, just because of my work schedule. I like to eat before I go to work. I just need to do that. Um, so that's really where I am right now. Which is excellent, because it seems like you're getting wisdom from what you do. 100%. Because that's what a lot of people don't do. Is, uh, like today I was on Facebook. Uh, and I'm in a lot of groups. I, sometimes I'm just in there to be a silent observer. Yes. A lot of these keto groups. And yes. one of the big things today was uh, these fried mozzarella pepperoni bites yeah. that people are eating like all day. Yeah. That's what we classify as a dirty keto. You know, that's like fun food if like you want to eat something yeah. and you don't have any carbs, but there's really like no nutritional value. Is that Atkins more? I, I like, don't know. It was on the keto page, yeah. but it's like, you know, there's dirty keto. Uh, yeah. I try to get their way really away from people doing that. Like I do I do workshops. I do they're, they're very in depth. So I do a, a fat adaptive diet workshop, which is paleo and keto. Okay. I explain in detail how it works, and I talk about, talk about nutrients, and then we talk about intermittent fasting. But the thing is, with a lot of patients and uh, people that attend these uh, workshops, they want to start all do intermittent fasting first, because they don't have to change anything, and it just changes mm -hmm. the amount of time they eat. So then, all right, so you're gonna fast for 18 hours, and then you're gonna eat like shit for six hours. Mm -hmm which makes no sense. No. So let's get you basically starting vegetables with every meal. And everybody's like, what, I gotta eat vegetables for breakfast? I'm like, well, yeah, that's basically yeah. what you're gonna have to do with every meal. And they're like, all right. And then, well, when do I start eating the bacon? I'm like, no, 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 there's no bacon. So what we're gonna do, and don't get me wrong, I like bacon. Mm -hmm. You know, I like I like animal fox. But then it's like, next week we're gonna have you start putting some olive oil or some avocado oil on your vegetables that you're eating and then slowly pulling away the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've mentioned this before, I, I like pizza. I, I really thoroughly enjoy pizza. Mm -hmm. So I have pizza once in a while, but I, that's fun food. But that's not like you were making a great example before of how you look at food and what can that do for this. Mm -hmm. Whenever I see anything purple, I'm like, oh, cool, mm -hmm. anti-aging. I'm gonna eat some of that. Because not that I'm vain, but you know, if I could look younger, that's great. Why not? But uh, you need to see, look at food as fuel not as just, you know, I just got to eat something, some chips or something just to fill me up because it doesn't fill you up. Uh, Jen, you, you did paleo, correct? I did. When you were doing paleo, did you measure ketones at all? No, no. I was wondering if you were falling into ketosis at all with paleo, because some people do. I probably ate too much sweet potato during that time to <laughs> fall into ketosis. I feel like that was a big staple. Sweet potatoes and, uh, and chicken. All day. That was in a year and a half, thanks to Dr. Jan, the first carbohydrate, oh, I, true, uh, relatively starchy carbohydrate that I put mm -hmm. in my body that wasn't a trace carb. Um, yep. And, and mm -hmm. my God, I forgot how well they taste. Delicious. Yeah, a little ground yeah. cinnamon on it. Yep. But here's the cool thing. It's like after doing this run, you become completely fat adapted. Like you can dabble a little bit. Like I had a handful of sweet potato fries the other day. So you don't feel guilty about it at all because 90% of the time I'm fine, you know, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. So that's like, once you find a meal plan that you feel very comfortable in, you don't feel like you're depriving yourself, you have, you just, it, it feels right and then you can flow with it. But the minute you feel like you are sacrificing, I'm eating these foods that I don't enjoy, but I'm eating them because they're on this plan that I've subscribed to, you're gonna fail. Uh, agree. You know, so it, it, this is, I, I honest to God in my heart of hearts swear, I like how I'm eating now. I'm satisfied, I look forward to those salads with that olive oil and that pesto every day, mm, it's delicious, <laughs> you know? So it's cool, I'm fine with it, but I've done every other way of eating that I have not been happy with, and I'm just waiting to cheat, you know? I'm just waiting to, to like go out to dinner that night and see what's on the dessert menu, you know? Speaking of going out to dinner, how how do you maintain your your fitness and diet when you go? Because uh, personally, some of the questions I always get from people are, okay, I can eat this way, but I also want to be social. I, I I have this event or that event. Right. I had a client actually say to me this week, or maybe last week, she said, ever since I started dating, I stopped intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. and I said, why is that? She said, well, sometimes I'm having dinner at nine or nine thirty, and I and I asked her, I said. Where's the law that says your intermittent fast has to be 16 hours right. or it doesn't work? I said, right. where is that? She, right. And she looked at me. And I explained to her, I said, so if you're dating that night, mm -hmm. I said, do you go on dates every single night? 
when you can extend your fast, extend it. When you can, you, you don't. Can. You know, live life. Don't set yourself up for failure. Exactly. exactly. If you set the bar too high, you're just going to keep coming up short, and then you're just going to get disgusted and lose steam and, and stop. But, you know, I think we do have experience under our belt, so when we do go out to eat, we can kind of, like, navigate that menu, right? So it's like, ooh, that's over rice, I'm going to say hold the rice, what kind of vegetable, can I have a side? Like, you know, you know how to do that a little bit more. People who are just starting out, trying to figure out how to eat well, they, they don't have that knowledge or that history. So I do understand it's harder, you know? I can make some simple suggestions for patients, and they're like, oh my god, that's brilliant. And it's not, it's not at all. It's but experience. it's just experience, you know? Um, I don't have a hard time staying in a good place eating out just because I, I understand how it works enough and what I can switch around. But sometimes, like if I'm going out, like my family will going out and I didn't want to admit to my, my uh, stepmom, who's also a dietitian, that I'm doing keto because she probably would, her mind would be blown. So I had a piece of pizza, you know, sure. like that's it. But how you can kind of plan ahead is, all right, I'm having this pizza. So I'm going to stop eating early tonight. Just make sure, Jen, you're not going to eat late. You're not going to continue this training tonight. Oh, and then by the way, tomorrow morning, you know what you should probably do. Why don't you do that spin class instead of sleeping late? You know, just kind of like you plan your next day a little bit. You balance things out, and then it's fine. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to stress out if you're going to have one bad meal. I meals. think what you're saying is planning. That's planning. the most important plan thing. Well, my birthday is uh, September 22nd, two weeks. Yes. Just share it with uh, Joan Jett and Scott Bale. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my mom makes like phenomenal strawberry shortcake. Yes. And I'm going to have a couple pieces of strawberry shortcake. Mm -hmm. But they're coming over at 3 o'clock. So I'm going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to go and uh, go ride maybe 30, 40 miles on a bike in a fast state. Yep. Come back, you know, to eat a whole bunch of dark leafy greens, a whole bunch of veggies. To pretty much prep myself because we're going to have this cake. Right. Now, do I go to the extreme all the time? No. So, you know, we were out to dinner. Uh, the local restaurant, my wife and I, we work for our anniversary, our 11 year anniversary, and we kind of know what's on the menu. So it's not like a spur of the moment we're going out. I kind of knew a couple of days in advance. So the whole day, you know, I did a fast and workout in the morning, ate really clean, and then this way I could go ahead and enjoy myself at the end of the day. And like you mentioned, it's like, yeah, we've been doing this for a while, but it's really kind of common sense once you realize what works for me, what doesn't work for me. What you have to understand is that we're all completely different. We all have two arms, two legs, two nostrils, two ears, the whole nine yards. But the thing is, the way I react to certain foods is not the way somebody else is going to react to certain mm -hmm. foods. So I know I've been, I've been vegetarian, I've been vegan, I've done paleo, I've done keto, got wisdom from each one of those things, and now I know how to utilize them to achieve what my goals are. Right. And we, we know it pretty in depth, but I think it's important to realize you don't need to know it as well as we do. You don't need to. Sure. You can just make some nice common sense decisions so someone doesn't have to be, you know, okay if they're going to have a, uh, you know, they're going to have a cheap dinner. Do they have to work out in a fasted state that morning? No. Do they, you know, but it's like, okay, so just kind of know you're doing this. Maybe you're going to eat a little bit less during the day. Don't have that big lunch. And then tomorrow, you know, think about maybe go for a walk in the morning. And, and that's, and that's that'll be just as fine, yep. too, you know? And that, that's important, I think, for people because, especially when you look, if people are looking, I, I, I'm very strict to keto. Mm -hmm. I literally do not eat carbs. I, I envy you guys for doing the pizza. This thing. is all new, so don't, yeah, like I just felt brave enough to do that recently. But here's the truth <laughs> about me. Ever since I had, so in 2005 I had kidney cancer. It took part of my left kidney out. Um, I underwent surgery. Ever since then, my digestion system, my GI health just, it went down the tubes. Mm. And I had a hard time not racing to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So. Years, I tried this, I went gluten-free, I've been gluten-free since 2011, and it helped to an extent. Mm -hmm. But when I went keto, and I, I took sugar out of my diet, yeah. magic happened, and my gut health came back. Yeah. And I, I, I uh, like the fact that I have a little bit of a, a notice that I'm gonna need to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. and that's, <laughs> it's very friendly. Yeah. It's extremely friendly, and I speak openly about it. I really, am, no embarrassment about it, but, I don't, I don't want that issue. 
I don't want that issue. So it's easy for me to just avoid it completely. Which I don't understand with some people. People say, I eat this and oh my God, my stomach hurts so bad. But they can see you to eat it. Sure, totally. What are you doing? I, I don't, I don't, that I don't understand. I, right, but I feel like I've definitely, admittedly, have gone through food phases over the course of my life that I don't feel good about. And I keep finding myself in that hole. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing right now? And then you feel guilty. And it's like, you know, I find myself in the snack cabinet at work after a long day or in between a lot of patients or a stressful moment. You know, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm eating this. And I know tonight when I go home, I'm going to say, Jen, what the heck did you do today? Why did you eat that? You worked so hard this morning. And then you just, like, destroyed it. So it's like, I don't know if people do it either, but I think once you start to, like, own it, and that's what I told myself now. It's like, own it. You're going to have that dessert? Own it. And don't you dare feel guilty. And if you feel guilty, you better not do it because you're really going to put yourself in that mental, like, really bad cycle again. So um, the more conscious you are with your eating habits, the better. I don't understand the continuing to make bad decisions thing, though, and, like, being physical pain. Right. <laughs> it's a sometimes different story. You can actually come up with a different of research findings that shows it's sometimes out of your control, though. Um, Recent studies have showed out of the 100% of DNA in your body, only 2% of it is actually human DNA. The other 98% is basically all the bacteria organisms which are in your body. Right, 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 so right. when it comes to people who are having weight loss challenges, a lot of these people have poor GI systems. Mm -hmm. They have a very, uh, what we call benign, or um, their GI, their bacteria in their gut, is it's not diverse. They have only a couple different colonies of bacteria. So by increasing this gut health, by, by introducing a wide variety of different diverse bacteria, right. and they start overpopulating the poor bacteria, right. they have a tendency to be able to lose weight and reduce those cravings. Absolutely, because it, it's the bacteria that start running the show. Yeah, right? the bacteria wants sugar. Sugar, so that that's sends the brain, you know, so that's a then survival you see sugar, mechanism. And your yeah. GI tract, your GI is what makes all your neurotransmitters. So they're literally controlling your brain. Yeah. So if some bacteria sees a cupcake, it's yeah, you may think you're in control. You're really not in control. Yeah. So what yeah. you can do is I go on my kefir kick again, mm -hmm. I make my own kefir, I make my own kombucha, I eat like pickles, I eat sauerkraut mm -hmm. to really proliferate good bacteria in my gut. Yeah. It's true, and, and it sounds like, okay, you are drinking the Kool Aid Jen, and you're one of those crazy people, but when I tell you, I crave that avocado. Like, sure. I, cr I crave that, I crave that almond butter. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, it's the truth. I don't crave the sweets like I did, and I never in a million years would have said that I, you know, that was the tr truth, and it, and it is. Mm -hmm. So once you do, you retrain yourself and your brain and, and your gut Absolutely. to want these things, it really does work. Absolutely. I, I have to agree on that as well. I don't really have those cravings that I reach for. We, so I was at acupuncture before this podcast. <laughs> we were talking about it, and talking about macadamia nuts and almonds is wh where the conversation had gone to, and I reach for almonds. Mm -hmm. And then I don't, if I'm not putting it in my app, and counting, yeah. so it's a guess, right? So it's a handful at, at you know one o'clock, and then it's a handful at four o'clock, and then after dinner I have a little bit more. And all my, oh my god, all of a sudden I had so many almonds. <laughs> exactly. And um, you mentioned that you realize macadamia nuts. Yeah, they were they're killing me. But like, it, but here's the thing: the underlying reason why I wanted them is because they're they're just full of fat. I was just craving fat. Hello, of course, my system is running on fat at this point, so it makes sense why I was craving them. But yeah, they're they're pretty dense calorically. So as I finally cut them out, I probably was eating about 800 calories of macadamia yeah, nuts a day. Yeah, fat macadamia nuts Yeah, so. one of my patients is also keto. Brought me a big bag of the ones from Costco. Who are, they're like big acorns yeah. almost, like. Yeah, get that away from me. Dr. Jane uses them on the bike. Uh, yeah, so I uh, try to ride in a fasted state. I have a little uh, Ziploc bag macadamia nuts. Usually when I hit like the 60, 70 mile yeah. portion of the ride, I start getting a little bit hungry, so I pop a couple of macadamia nuts and that keeps me over. Yeah, me over. yeah. good stuff. Jane, you work a lot. Um, you see a lot of patients. How do, you, how do you balance the work life and let's just call it staying, staying healthy and fit? It's, it's definitely, um, 
the thing that I've had to work the hardest on since I've owned my own business, I definitely was not great at that at all for the first maybe two years of starting the practice. You know, I would, I would not work out because I would get up at the crack of dawn to quickly start working on work things, take a shower, go to work, work all day, not bring food. Yeah, maybe I would bring some almonds and a yogurt at that point in my life, maybe a kind bar, you know, and that's all I would eat all day. I would go home, I'd have a glass of wine, and I'd go to bed, you know, and that's how I lived for a while. Um, since th that crashed and burned after a couple of years, I knew I was in absolute adrenal fatigue and I couldn't take it anymore, and I was falling to pieces. So that was the impetus, like, all right, I gotta get something going here. Um, so, I can never, every day the two things that are the most important to me are I need to know what I'm going to eat that day and I need to know what I'm going to, if I'm going to work out that day, what am I going to do? Like I need to plan ahead for that every single day. If I don't, it's not going to be a good day and I know it in the morning and I just prepare that, okay, but when I'm going to get home tonight, I'm going to be done. Um, but if I, if I, I, it sounds like it might be a little lame and boring, but it is that structure of every day that allows me by Friday night not to feel like crap and have a great weekend. You know, I'm not spending Saturday recovering from a really busy week. So yes, in the morning do I get up early and I food prep for that day? Yes. Is it super complicated? No. So I figured out a way to make it. These are the things that I have already in the fridge all the time. I can put something together quick and it's great, you know. Um, my workout, I try to do every work day um that's my meditation we spoke about that right that's where i clear my head that's where i sweat it out that's where i get some endorphins going i take a shower i go to work i have food for the afternoon i have food for when i come home for dinner i get eight hours of sleep life is good you know every once in a while you kind of fall off of that but you know i i think my 20 year old self would be like really embarrassed by my 30 year old self like who's this, this old lady but you know i just I, i'm the best person that i am at work when i'm in this routine um i'm thinking most clearly i'm giving the best treatment so you know i feel really good but you, it, you know it's it's work to make that routine happen short discipline yeah Doc, I see a pattern with the people who are remaining, who, who manage to remain healthy and, and fit. Yep. And it's one common denominator, and, and it seems to be that planning. Yeah, it's discipline. Discipline uh, uh, for Jocko Willing, discipline equals freedom. I mean, mm -hmm. as long as you're disciplined, you're going to be able to do the things you want to do. You have your social life, too. Yeah. It's when you become undisciplined where you're basically all over the place. And I like, I have a definition for discipline, and, and I don't know if this is the actual definition, but what I like to say about discipline is, it's doing what you do not want to do when you do not want to do it. Yeah. Right? So, I don't want to be all prep. Yeah. Can't I just order something? But you do it because you know that that's the smarter approach, or, or take your food to work instead of going and ordering or getting food out. Yeah. So I think, I, and I used to overthink it, right? So I used to like Sunday, I would go to the farmer's market and I would go to the grocery, I'd go to three different grocery stores and I would have all these recipes that I would make and I would spend all day Sunday meal prepping for the week. By Sunday night, I was so tired. And then, you know, so I, I was doing all of this work to have this discipline, but the work was too much. So I really figured out that I don't want to resent this fact that I'm, you know, that I have to do this meal prep. So I've just made it so simple, you know, like, okay, let's scale this back here. This is all way over the top. It's amazing and it's beautiful and it's so nutritionally dense, but it's not necessary. So if I was, so I can, you know, I can really taper it down to I have a nice system in place that doesn't exhaust me. So I don't resent that meal prepping anymore. I really don't, it's simple, it's easy, and I'm actually excited, you know, like here's my food for the day, that's great. So it's also figuring out a way to do it in a way that's not exhausting for you too. It shouldn't be, it should be relatively easy. Tell us about training, what type of training do you do, with exercise and stuff? I know you mentioned you had done CrossFit in the past. I, that has been a, like a lifelong journey of trying different things. So yes, I've done yoga. I used to do Pilates all the time. I used to run all the time, not competitively, but you know, going for a run after work was always my go-to workout. I worked in a gym for a bunch of years, like I mentioned. So strength equipment. Um, what I do now is again, I finally. Over the last few years, I've also figured out my 
workout regimen that is able that's more sustainable for me, which is really don't stress about it too much and really just freaking enjoy it. Sure. So it's like, what is it that I like to do, Jen? You know, do I do I like to go to the gym and sit in and drive there and didn't get to that class? No, I really don't. And my time is precious, so I am done as much as I can doing things that are supposed to be quote unquote healthy that I just don't enjoy doing. There's plenty of other things that I can figure out to do. So what I've learned to do is not set myself up for um, disappointment. So I have this half an hour to an hour every morning. You know, it's I've, sometimes an hour and a half if I can swing it. But at least a half hour every day that I do something. I have a home gym now. I kept out. You know, I made my my space in my house. I can rotate from different things. Um, variation is absolutely key for me. So it can be. It's usually like a high intensity, like half an hour, and then some cardio. Maybe maybe not cardio if I don't have time. But I really do like weights. I like being strong. Like that. That is that's fun to me. You feel powerful. So I really enjoy that part and then maybe three days a week I'll do spin the Peloton I resisted buying for years and now that I have it I love it you get a good sweat in so every day it's something different and again if it's not a huge workout that day it's like let it go don't feel bad about it you had 20 minutes and you did what you could do in 20 minutes and the other convenience day. of having the gym at your house right there. I know Dom and myself same thing best investment I did yeah was have a, like a very nice gym in my house pretty much for the majority of my equipment off prices yeah so this way it's I just live at the wake up yeah. go through my morning routine get my workout in and it's done for the it's day done. I look forward to it people sure. say they wouldn't have discipline to do that if it was at home if they didn't have to go to the gym they wouldn't have discipline to do it and I do understand that, but again, the key for me was make it something that you do enjoy. And, and you're also, like you said, your time's precious. Yeah. So you're saving that time, the trip to the gym, the right, trip coming right, back right, home. Right. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Doc, anything in closing? No, I think this is great. This is very useful information for everybody out there. It's very practical. You know, so like you, you made a great point. You, you, you don't need to know everything, but there's a couple tools that we discussed today in our other podcast too, which will really put you in a position to succeed and achieve your goals. I think when you, when you look at basic things, it's, it's planning and discipline. And you, you made a great point. It's, it's time is precious. But the only thing you're not ever going to get back is your time. So you need to be, to have discipline, to have planning, you know, you, you make a checklist. So this way you know what you need to do that day. Got to work out. The other thing too, with uh, when you talked about how easy it is to do your your meals, intermittent fasting. I mean, if you introduce intermittent fasting into your lifestyle, it makes the eating a lot easier because you just have a eight to ten hour window that you're gonna be eating. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I agree. That intermittent fasting just works for me. We've had this conversation uh, numerous times, but and it, I don't believe it's for everybody. I don't believe the time frame is for for every single person. But it's definitely convenient. Yep. Very convenient. Jen, anything you'd like to say in closing? No, I just I appreciate you guys having me. It's it's I think it's very helpful that um, it's I think also often we're bombarded by like these very specific ways that are defined as healthy, right? So it's like this is the meal plan you should do, or this is the way you should exercise, and this is gonna be the answer, and this is gonna be the key. And I think as healthcare professionals, we are not doing anyone justice if we adopt to just like a one specific yeah, way of thinking, right? You know, it's like if I sign up for the Jennifer McDowell wellness plan, like this is the strict diet that I need. No, like that, that's not it. So I think um, as practitioners, that is definitely um, our responsibility to explain to people that like you are able to be healthy and define your own, you know, limits of what that means, right? So within your own framework of your own lifestyle, it's absolutely possible you don't have to subscribe to one certain way. You know, there's not one answer. Absolutely. So I, I appreciate that you guys also believe in that because sometimes it's really 100%. hard to find, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, once again, Jennifer McDonald from Jennifer Lane Acupuncture and Wellness. The website is jenniferlane.com, is yeah, that correct? That's she it. is located at 67 Home Avenue in Rutherford, New Jersey. Phone number 201-636-2614. Jenna, are you on social media? I am, Would yes. you like to? 
And you know what? what? I think it's if you just kind of do the Jennifer Lane acupuncture on Instagram and Twitter, it'll come up. But yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Elite Performance Team podcast. Dr. Jan Caswitz, Dominic Perillo. Train your brain, mm -hmm. train your body. No excuses. <laughs>